ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another Bug Watch. I am your boy Swissly, also known as Davey. I'm here to talk to you today about Vanguard Onslaught and some of the cool tips and tricks that they can do. I hate talking about myself, but Tom told me to get grip and I've decided to do a video. So we are doing that. I've got a wonderful can of a stray dam in my, cat, in my hand. I'm very excited to talk to you about this today. But before we start, you know like and subscribe to the video if you haven't already like come on guys we need to get this out there we need to get more uh, vanguard onslaught players in the game because it's the funnest detachment in this in the faction by a mile it's so much more fun than synaptic nexus come on guys and if you are white bread um if you're loving that white bread on i want you to call it i can't remember what it's called now the main faction uh then cool you know enjoy in, you enjoy you do you but please give Vanguard Onslaught a chance. It is so much fun. Um, so why am I talking about it today? Well, I've had a good run with it. Um, I have played 16 competitive games with it in the last month and a bit. And I've won 11, drew one and lost four. That's maths, right? Yeah. Um, so I won two RTTs with it, which is really cool. You can see on the left, I won this tiny, lovely but tiny trophy, uh, which you can now see on display like in glittery goodness in my downstairs toilet. Um, ah, yes, you can see me there receiving said trophy in front of the ice cream machine. My life is extraordinarily glamorous. Uh, I also won a RTT at Kingdom to Gaming, which I'm really happy about. Um, that was the second time I've been to that event and I was really happy to win it. So I've also, in for some of the stuff we're gonna go through, I've included some practice games. I had about uh, 11 and losing eight of them. So one of the things, that uh, I would say is that, yes, it's all about nice and great to win things, but you don't see what goes on behind the scenes. And that is me getting my backside handed to me by my teammates on TTS a lot. So be aware that, uh, and, and you know, not be aware, but use your practice games properly, right? If you are going to try something, try it, just go for it. Who cares if you lose a practice game? It's the competitive games you should care about. Cool. All right. Um, so the key themes of the army are uh, easily the most fun detachment, in my opinion. Um, it's desperately unforgiving. <laughs> like if you make a mistake, you're screwed. Um, but it's quite, I think it's a really good way to learn how not to make mistakes. I have never pre-measured as much in my entire life as I have with this detachment. Um, I have never deliberated as much in my entire life with this detachment. I go to time on the round probably too much. I'd like to be finishing earlier. I think the last GT I was at, uh, the Hertfordshire Winter GT, great event. You should go to them, guys. Their rounds are a little bit um, shorter. So I think I, I I went to almost time on four rounds uh, when, and then one on never. So, yeah, it's desperately unforgiving, um, but and it requires a lot of thought. But I think it's a great way if you are trying to improve as a player to really kind of give yourself a baptism of fire. It keeps games close. It, so it's a strange one, right? You know, you see like really great detachments, etc. Just muller people like Eldari will 140 people. Vanguard Onslaught doesn't really do that. For my, from in my personal opinion, regardless of who I'm playing, it's going to either give it's going to give them a game or me a game. If it's a a player with less player skill, it'll give them a game back into me. If it's a player who's better than me, it'll give me a chance to get into it. And that's because it uses a universal and undeniable game mechanic to keep units alive and that is loan up um you can have the best shooting army in the world but if you're outside of 12 inches and i spend a cp on my warrior unit you cannot shoot them um so there's there's things like that that kind of just make it it just gives you a chance in games right it scores secondary for fun because tyranids do um it you know you've got your biovores you've got all that jazz you can you're very fast so you can get across the board quite quickly so it does score secondary for fun however it cannot hold an objective through durability because we are an army of three up and four up saves there's a couple of invulns in there but obviously not enough um so whatever we put on an objective will die if you are unable to protect it in other means so like you know if you are for example uh, Deathwing Knights, you can go and stand on an objective and go, well, I guess I'm still going to be here next time. We could put a squad of warriors on an objective and there's absolutely no guarantee they'll be there next next turn. The only way to guarantee in this detachment that you will have an objective is if you stop people moving within 12 inches of the of your Neuralictor, for example, on the objective. 
using gargoyles and move blocks and things like that um or just being far away from your opponent's threats really they're the only ways you can you can do it reliably of course you can you know take out key assets and then stand an objective blah 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 there's there's obviously exceptions to the rule but you tend to kind of get the edge then score your primary in the way that well, the way that i play it there are other types of lists that, we've, that are in Vanguard Onslaught. Um, I'm going to go through a couple of those as well because they're really cool lists and very different ways of playing the game to what I'm doing. Um, and they can hold objectives, but they do the similar thing, right? They're trying to uh, stop their opponent getting within 12. And we'll go into that in a minute anyway. All right. Um, so you might know, I don't know if you know, but in my job, I deal with data a lot. So we're going to talk about data. I'm going to see how many of you guys survived this boring shit. Right, let's go. Um, Stat Checks website is amazing. You should definitely go and have a look at it. But Vanguard Onslaught make up just over one in five players um, and has one of the highest win rates of that faction. So we can see the win rate is 50% with 22% of the players. We've got Assimilation Swarm, which is a um, cool Tyranid guy, Maelstrom Wargaming. I think his YouTube channel is. And he is taking Assimilation Swarm to a couple of, I think, Three twos, maybe a four one as well. So fair play to him doing that. It's a very cool detachment. I just can't afford all those pyrovores. Um, so yeah, so but we're doing great. We've got fifty percent win rate in twenty two percent. What's really interesting about that? It's a very small data set, but when you cut it down to player experience, the more experienced players are bringing it down, while the newer players. So I think the experienced players were like twenty two percent, but the newer players were sixty percent win rate. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> um, so that's quite cool. In terms of points scored, um, we can see the two graphs at the bottom. So on the left-hand side, we've got total factions. And you can see that gradual curve up to the middle from pretty much right at the edges. Again, small sample size, guys, to be totally clear. But if you look at the Vanguard Onslaught and you were to smooth it out a little bit, you would see that it's a bit more of a narrow, narrow curve, right? And I think that's because it keeps those games close. You don't muller your opponent. Sometimes you do get mullered when you look at some of these scores on the left-hand side but you don't tend to muller your opponent. It tends to be more close games, which I think is a fantastic way to live your 40k life if you enjoy being in constant anxiety. When I look at the games I've played, uh, I've put them all through uh, the wonderful thing. You might have heard it, it's called Excel. And I've worked out essentially like my averages, and I do this quite often. I always like to know what the weaknesses of my list are. You know, if I'm under if I'm underperforming in my primary, how can I then that 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 is an issue, right? So I can try and fix it. Same with secondaries, etc. Uh, so this sample size it does include my uh, practice games, so that I've got a bit more, you know, uh, oomph to the data. So when I'm winning, my primary is still relatively low, 82%. So there's a good 20% extra of my primary I could go after. But as I've mentioned before, it's quite difficult for this detachment to do that because we are made of paper. But my secondary game is much closer to maxing at 90% with 36 points on average. So really pleased with my secondary score. My primary is still good at 41 points on average. So only nine points more to uh, to max that. But still, you can see my secondary game is a bit stronger than my, prim uh, than my primary. Um, what's more interesting than this, actually, is that I hold my opponent back on primary too. So just they just achieved 62% of their primary score. And obviously that kind of plays into that tactic I was saying about before, trying to move block and keep your opponents more than 12 inches away from secondary object, uh, from um, objective markers so that you can hold it. But more importantly, they can't get to it. So very important in this detachment, you will learn to move block. If you don't know how to move block, play this detachment 10 times, you will learn to move block. It happens. Um, and of course, the secondary score is still pretty good at 70%. It's not awful, you know, Um so they're still they're still getting away with most of it. I think that's probably because I tend to give my opponent their half of the board, and then kind of probe into it if I'm if I've got a foothold later in the game, so they get to score a few points. And again, I don't really mind my opponent scoring as long as I'm scoring more. And that's one of the key things that will come out uh, when we look at the plan is a very keen eye on the scoreboard. When I'm losing, however, I drop points on secondaries. Well, my opponent's primary leaps that 32 points. So you can see, um, percentage-wise, my secondaries take the largest hit, but in actual terms, I lose around seven points on both sec on both um, secondaries and primaries for an average, of, a total average of 14 points between my secondary, my losing scores and winning scores. 14 points. That is so few points. If you said, to, if I said to you, every time you play, if you score 15 points more, 
you're gonna you got a much better chance of winning the game. That's insane. What does that tell me? It tells me where I am. He's quite reliable at scoring, um, and it tells me that it's more around denying my opponent scoring necessarily, or it's you know, you know I think it's you know I can do a lot more by denying my opponent because when they win, they gain 22 points, two thirds uh, two thirds of which comes from primary. So their scores when they lose is 22 points lower than their scores when they win. And 14 points of that comes from primary. Mental. So the key learning is that to win games with this detachment, denying primary is absolutely key. And if they're not standing on it, I can be there with my wonderful, wonderful, beautiful, snaky, sneaky loan up boys. So with that in mind, let's look at the list. So there's three lists here. On the left is my list. And then I've took two other lists that I think are super cool. So Colin Watts list. Um, big thank you to High Fleet Phil, I believe it is, who's posted that in the Discord a, a while ago now. So apologies if I've got that wrong. Um, and then Tesla called Caswell, which um, a chap. I can't, my brain, I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry. I will buy you a pint at the Nottingham GT. Um, who, who's put in Tesla calls Pasquale list, which is also really interesting. So these three lists, I think they're slightly different. They're very different in how they play. So if look at my list. My list is very reactive. So I've got Death Leaper, a neuro tyrant with Hunting Grounds. Hunting Grounds is awesome. It denies my opponent so many points through a game uh, in terms of just every time they come in from reserve. On the two up, they take a Battleshock test. The amount of deployed teleport homers that do not happen is immense. So that's very nice. Um, and it just does really well against things like demons, not grey knights. They are, I think, they're, ex they're exempt from the rule. So by uh, unless that's FAQ'd, that they don't count towards it. I've got two primes, one with Nero Node for the redeploy, obviously very useful. Three times ten gargoyles, a biovore, three times uh, exocrines. They just keep my opponent honest. Um, I've been pointing them. If they they can just get around the board and shoot. My opponent can't stand in the open, which they could do if my my army was full of sneaky boys. Three Neurolictors because they're amazing and really make the army tick. They also save me CP throughout the game because I'm not spending it on surprise assault. I get these guys to do it instead, and then I have extra CP to be reactive and keep my stuff alive in my turn. Pyrovores, um, I some I've been trying all different types of pyrovores. They're quite good at screening as well. Uh, if you've got 30 points left, they're absolutely worth it because their bases are enormous. Um they also obviously remove cover for the exocrines, which is more useful than you think it is. All of a sudden, you're their um, ta uh, the Tau Crisis suits or the Votan Terminators will fail a Battleshock test. And then all of a sudden, you're like, huh, that's interesting. I, uh, I can absolutely stop these guys surviving if I take cover off them. Also, they can come in from reserve and just, you know, bother some Eldari aspect warriors who just are getting a bit cocky for their own good um i don't like rippers but i think there's game to them but i've got two little blocks here they are screening like the pyrovores are essentially i had 40 points left instead of 30 but the two rippers i do think there's game for them in that oc denial and i wonder if there's some finesse you can do with that i'm really interested in it but we shall see i'm gonna have a i'm gonna try and concentrate on that a little bit more in future games a trigon which has no synergy with the list whatsoever but regularly comes out as the MVP, just denies points and scores points. The amount of times I've had capture enemy outpost and went, aha, uh -huh, interesting. Um, or I've brought the Trigon down in a rapid ingress, then drawn ca uh, capture enemy outpost. Oh man, that is the dream. It's happened, I think, twice in 16 games, and it's been amazing. It also does a bit of work if your opponent flips your objective. So I had a game against demons. I had my Neurolictor on the objective. He flew over three Screamers. To the objective and was like haha you're not going to get those points now and because it was one of the missions where you don't score the objective in your in your home or their or their deployment zone i think or he was screening his deployment zone out really well anyway i just went well screw it i'm just gonna put the drag on there and then um yeah you, he had nothing in range to deal with it because he's demons and uh, and yeah i just took that point back and then smacked up those screamers next time two times six melee warriors so these are my bricks these are my hammers um hammers that kill two out of five um terminators from uh, custodies terminators um yeah they're good though so they have six attacks each re-rolling ones and then the prime gives them exploding sixes they can hit on twos if you use the stratagem they are twin linked onto wounds so they're really good in that way i prefer them to gene stealers 
I think it's just preference, really. There's not a lot of great deal in. There's ways you could argue either way, but I just prefer the Warriors. And then a new addition is 6-1 Ryan's Leapers. I loved them, then I hated them, and now I love them again because there's some cool stuff you can do with them, which we'll go into later. So that's my list. We've then got Colin's Watt, Colin Watts' list. Uh, I was very lucky Rob and our team managed to play him, so he gave me a bit of the lowdown on how, it, how he plays. But essentially, this is a pressure list. It's going to try and keep you in your deployment zone, stop you scoring primary, and it does that by having three times six uh, Ravenous, three times six Von Ryan Leapers that are just three wound bodies that will stand in front of your opponent's army and do stuff. The Ravenous have that even better tech that they've got the guns rather than the armor save. What does that mean? Well, it means they have assault so they can advance and do actions in your opponent's deployment zone. So if you are trying to deploy teleport homers, uh, get behind them lines, things like that, they're very good at that. Um, Otherwise, very similar to my list, but that those choices in the units really switch from reactive to proactive. Colin is, um, Colin has a game plan and he's going to try and act it out. Uh, I love this list. If I had the models, I'd absolutely try this. I played it on TTS once and it was a great deal of fun. I scored like 75 points in three turns and then lost the game at the end because I was tabled. So yeah, really good fun list. Definitely, if you have 18 Raveners knocking about, get this list on the table. It's good fun. And then finally, you've got Tesla Coil Tashual. Gotta to love those Spanish guys with their names. Um, <laughs> so, um, two Broodlords with Neuro Nodes, so Kane, like dealer's choice with the Warriors. So you can see that they're probably going with, yeah, they're going with the two 10, ten Man Gene Sealer squads. Um, again, doing the same thing with Neuro Node for the redeploy. Then we've got Death Leaper, three Winged Hive Tyrants with Chameleonic, or well, one that got Chameleonic, sorry, three Lictors, Neuro Lictor. Two Ripper Swarms, three times six death, uh, round Von Ryan's Leapers. So if I think, and I don't know, I've not spoken to this guy or I don't know, I've not seen anything, but the way I think this kind of works is you put everything on the line. If you go second, you redeploy two of the Winged Hive Tyrants um, and yeah, or maybe you start them in reserve. <laughs> I don't, it's so difficult because you'd maybe pull back the Von Ryan's. The thing with the Von Ryan's is you can put them quite close to each other and they can heroically intervene to each other's so if one of them gets charged you can have another unit heroically intervene they've got fight first so they fight first it's just they're quite fun and they're very tricksy which is why i like them um the winged hive tyrants here have got some really cool tech in that they all have proxism i don't think anywhere it says that that proxism ability doesn't stack if you don't know what proxism is it's on a two up your, you point at a unit within 12 that you can see and you give them minus one attack. Can you imagine that into custodies or uh, aggressors or things like that? If you put your 10 man GNC in the squad or the Von Ryan's Leapers into a unit, then all three guys point it and say, you could just get minus one attack. That is a rough afternoon. <laughs> you know, if you've got a six man unit who's normally used to killing stuff, all with one attack each, your Von Ryan's Leapers are going to have a great time. So really like the... Uh, the tech there, I feel like the CP, uh, like to keep those wing time tyrants alive is heavy, but I would love to see that list in action. So these are three lists that I've picked out. They're really fun, um, and uh, but all very different. I think that uh, Collins and Tesla Coil Tastual are kind of both proactive. I think Tesla Coils is pretty more, you know, based on what meta you're going into. You know, if you are going into low unit count i mean knights for example geez louise you know like if you can reduce the attack characteristic of a um armager or something like that or, or even a big knight super strong so yeah very interesting that's more of a techie one if you know your uh, meta but let's look at what uh vanguard onslaught kind of does well uh, again i looked at stat check for this we can see you can see at the top if you zoom in um, each faction's win rate. But what I've done is I've pulled out some of the, the key ones or the, the best and the worst. Again, low sample size here, guys, to be absolutely clear. But um, we can see that Vanguard plays best into factions that really want to do similar things to us in terms of getting around the board, teleporting, janking, but tend not to be durable. You know, a bit more like, you know, um, uh, like Grey Knights, the, you know, they have armor saves, don't be wrong, but they can struggle. Um, GSC, which, you know, we can screen out and T-Suns again. Um, I don't think they have an armor of contempt kind of ish ability. And I think we can just get into them when possible. 
Not played them personally, so I cannot talk to that. Also, you see Custodes and Knights in here. Uh, I think that's really down to low model count and potentially just move blocking the crap out of them. Um, so yeah, pretty strong. Our worst matchups tend to be durable and killy armies. Um, if you know, essentially, if they can see us, we die. Uh, and they're durable, so they're full of vehicles, um, terminators, things like that. That we are probably on fives to wound with our elite elite infantry. So yeah, fun, funky one there, but tends to be durable and killy armies. And you know, how does this play out in my experience? Well, I've played again these sixteen competitive games. Um, I would say that my first point here, I think the key driver of match outcome really is player skill. The I think in ninth you could be a reasonable player. A reasonable player could beat a good good player with if they had the better army, right? I think now you can have the best meta army in the game, but player skill really shines through at the moment, in my personal opinion. So if we look at the the games that I've won, we've got CSM, Aldari. Um, demons in there, Tyranids, Grey Knights, Tau. So we like armies that are fast with low durability, armies like us. We also like armies that have a lot in reserve. So, for example, Demons, Grey Knights do put stuff in reserve. Um, Eldari can sometimes, that you know, Sweeping Hawks go away and come back. Um, CSM players can, um, you know, start Forge Fiends in reserves, for example, things like that, or Demon Allies. So that's quite cool. Tau, obviously, crisis suits. The best feeling in the entire world is when a Tau crisis suit comes down from reserves, fails its battle shock, and your Exocrines are just hiding behind buildings ready to kill them. But much like the stat check data, I have lost to heavy vehicle lists. Really struggling to that, um, especially if you go second because you can't move block them in. If a land raider makes its way onto that middle objective, God damn it, it's hard to get rid of. Um, the Round Raider Redeemer is the bane of this art, of this detachment's um, existence. Those flamers just muller everything. We also, one thing to point out, and again, this is one game, so I can't, can't say it's like a trend, but Custodes minus one to hit in combat is a nightmare because you've got your, um, you have to spend a CP to like nullify that. So like, if you, I go into the Wood Warriors, something like that, it's real rough. I imagine it's obviously the same for Death Guard because they have that ability as well. So your ex crins will be doing work in those games. Cool. All right. So what are we doing in game? Well, in game, so deployment, this tends to be kind of, I've tried to think, what do I do in deployment? Uh, you, I don't know if it's about you, but I kind of got autopilot in it. So what I am tend to do is obviously the Trigon or the Tyragon, in, as I've spelt here, goes in reserve. Some amount of gargoyles. So maybe two squads and one on the board if you're against someone who's super aggressive and you just want to screen them. So, for example, our good friends, the World Eaters. Um, but failing that, I tend to put them all in reserve because the Fire and Fade ability is so, 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 so good. And then turn three, I'll bring one back, put it behind the building in my home objective, and uh, uh, you know, very safe, and then wait till turn five and jump them out to either move block my opponent getting max primary at the end of the game, or for myself just to get max primary at the end of the game. A squad of warriors. Now, if you are against something like out of line of sight shooting, you can put have one squad of warriors on the table because then you can loan up it if they're just targeted with out of line of sight shooting. Uh, I also like to put one in reserve simply because the base size is so big and it's quite hard to hide. If you've gone, I was at Peterborough Slam, they have less terrain than on the uh, Hertfordshire GT that I went to. So it tends to be a paper slam. I put a squad in reserve and the Hertfordshire GT, I started both on the table. Pyrovors, so pretty good coming out of reserve and just taking cover off something. Pretty good. Also, nice to screen, things like that. 30 points, they do a thing. Their base is so big, they're hard to hide. They take up a lot of real estate behind a terrain piece. So you don't necessarily you want that for your warriors and you know your biovores, things like that. So having a pyrovore there can be a bit of a crook sometimes. So I tend to put them in reserve. And then Von Ryan's, if you go second, so you can redeploy them with Neuroload, get them out of there, and there's a nice, cool little trick you can use with them, which I'll go into in a minute. Um, my typical employ deployment includes Biovar Neurotarrant on the home objective. It's a joint OC of four, which is really nice, because if you're, for example, um, Plasma Interceptors come down, that's only three. You can overwatch them if you've got the CP, and maybe kill one of them. 
and then you definitely got it because they're not going to kill a neuro tyrant but they might kill the biovore so that's quite nice uh, you can also with those two bases screen out most of the objectives so they can't really get many people on it so the neuro tyrant stays on the home objective until you shadow the warp then you can do whatever you want with it Exocrines all hidden behind ruins. I like to do the hex exocrine shuffle. So you you put it sideways, you put it sideways, and then stick its big long phallic gun out the front, so it can see get angles. And then if the angle changes to the other side of the ruin, you just reverse it back up and shoot that way instead. We also have death leaper and a neurolichter near an easy near uh, your opponent's easy objective. Um, that's really fun because what you do is I'll show you this on a, on a couple of maps in a minute. But essentially, being near to it. If they move something onto the objective, your neurolichter will point it and say, take a battle shock test. If they fail, Death Leaper runs in and hopefully gobbles them up because not a lot of stuff can get to an objective that fast, except Votan, which we'll see in a minute. Um, a neurolichter in the middle, to uh, ideally behind a building, obviously you don't want to put it out in the open, but it will deny area denial because not a lot of people can get to, you know, um, 15 inches away from their deployment zone or want to risk that because then it puts a unit out in the open and you can absolutely slam them. Um, and of course, Von Ryan's Leapers bearing down on your opponent alongside a Neurolichter, ready to redeploy if they go first. But if you if you go first, you point at something, say a take a battle shock test, and then the Von Ryan's probably go after them and hopefully have a good day of it. So let's see um, an example of some of my deployments. Uh, there's errors here. I've made errors in my deployment zone, guys. So apologies for that. <laughs> but this was my last game against Votan last at the weekend. We can see that I've got my two Neurolictors here. That one's, there's very, very few places for me to hide here. So I could go in this building here on the objective, but I'm just opening the door to getting charged. And then if he gets Storm Hostile objective at some point, just killing that guy. Um, so what I've done is I deployed this guy here, this guy here, so I could protect this one, protect that one to an extent. From this one because it 12 inches doesn't reach the end with this neurolichter and then this red line here was a line of von Ryan's leapers and a neurolichter so essentially pointing at something and then charging it move blocking these guys this is just after their scout move or yeah i think it's just after the scout move so this guy's moved forward this guy's moved forward this guy's moved forward as well but prior to that obviously being nine inches away they wouldn't have been able to come close to me if i went then from first i could have absolutely got into them and get onto their objective. Getting onto their objective with six Von Ryan's Leapers is really good because if they haven't got a um, a token, a grudge token in this case, then minus one to hit them, they're going to be hitting on fives, right? It's absolutely outrageous. Um, if they do have a grudge token, they're still hitting on fours. Being on that objective, they probably take a lot of shots from these bikes and maybe die. But you've got to think it's um, 18 wounds on a four up save with stealth. And a six up invuln if you really need it. Like they do some stuff, man. They do some stuff. And being able to cause a ruckus in here will just delay a lot of this stuff from getting out of his deployment zone. And if you get, and that's what we're talking about. That's what we're trying to do, right? We're trying to keep our opponent away from those middle objectives. Maybe he puts some resource backwards, some resource forwards, and then all our warrior squads here, over here, and there's one behind this wall are just ready to clean up. Um, what else is interesting? Um, one error I made here was I didn't pre-measure enough. This little chap here, this little um, uh, Sagittar, scout moved, then moved up here, shot the exocrine, double sixes on the hit, and then like nine shots or something, and then just killed it in a one -er. So that was crap to be down an exocrine from the very start of the game, but I thought I was safe over here. In fact, I wasn't. One thing to note in the world time matchup is you might think you outrange them with a 36 inch gun on your exocrines, but they make that distance very quickly in those Sagittars. So yeah, you can see my uh, Neurotyrant and Exocrine uh, Biovore just here. Death Leaper did start over here, but he was redeployed back here. Again, nice and safe. What I did was said, how far can this guy go? Then he moves, then he shoots. So then I moved to Death Leaper to 12.5 inches away from where that guy could get to. So he felt very safe. And this in this place here, he can move to the right, he can move to the left and just try and bother people and uh, yeah uh, pretty much you can go to on this objective if he wants and be loan up and just be annoying for him yeah bits like that one of the things that is also interesting here is my opponent has deployed these bikes like this why have they done that because he's trying to screen out a trigon amazing 
what else could you ask for than your opponent having to really like really adapt their deployment to your army uh, so here's another example against Votan. This was at um, Peterborough Slam. So what this is after redeploy and after their scout move. So you can see they've got all over the board. Where was I? I had at the end of deployment before I found out if I was going first or second. Oh no, after I found out I was going no before I was going knew I was going first or second. This red dot here and this red dot here was a neurolictor. So they are bothering the middle, bothering this objective. Um, I did have a squad of warriors here as well. This was before I had the Von Ryans in the list. So a squad of warriors here, just ready to say, look, if you want to scout move towards me, you can absolutely can, but I will try and bother you real bad. If you want to bring your bikes out forward, I will try and do them in. Um, so as a threat, however, my opponent went first. So I redeployed this guy over here. I redeployed this guy. Ooh, where did he? I think he's over here somewhere, maybe. Uh, Maybe maybe start off the board actually I can't remember but yeah um, and then redeployed the warriors just totally off the board I kept my neurolictor up here and my and death leaper here because I measured this and he could get one guy to shoot death leaper I'm fine with that uh, if he brings all his bikes over here it's a big issue what actually happened in this game is death leaper went he ran over there and absolutely got into these bikes killed about three of them and stop this, get these guys from actually challenging this objective. So then he had to bring some assets from over here to try and get around there to bother it, which was really handy. Um, this is a man who knows what a trigon is. <laughs> so he knows what he's doing. He also knows what gargoyles do. So he um, was very, very uh, thorough on this. So yeah, um, that was that was that that deployment zone. So cool. So what we're trying to do now we're deployed. What's happening? What's the strategy? Well, it was split into three three thirds, turns one and two. We do what is needed. We don't do any more than that. We want to make the game long. We want to survive. We want to live because we need to score. We need to deny those primary points every turn and we need to score them every turn. So what is needed? You get your objective with your Neurolictor. You stage your warriors and you screen. You screen like a goddamn mofo. You get your gargles out if you have to. Turn one with the old one CP. Um, bring two units in. You can get up there with your one Ryan's Leapers, which is also a way of doing it without CP. You can get up there with Death Leaper if you want to, if you're playing um, maybe small knights or something like that. Um, yes, have a think. Will those aggressive move blocks change the game? Is it worth spending the CP to bring down two squads of Gargoyles or even one squad of Gargoyles um, to stop that Land Raider getting out in front of you? Uh, measure those six inches. If you, if you won't get overwatched if you can fire and fade in front of it. So try and Figure out a way to bring down those gargoyles and then fire and fade in front of the land raider so it cannot fire it cannot overwatch you and you block it right in and then uh deny easy points with screening so if you don't pull a secondary with your that you can score with your biovore for example go and stick it in the corner it'll screen that corner and you never know you might get investigate sites and each each corner is two points super good um so yeah very nice thing to do there Turns two to four, secure your primary by clearing quadrants. If you're playing on corner deployment, get into the, get into one corner and clear it while holding them off in the other, in the other corner with gargoyles or what have you and stopping them getting out. Um, I like to clear squad quadrants because we're not the killiest army, so we need all our assets to kind of clear that quadrant. Once it's clear, then move on to the next one. Um, continue to challenge their primary with gargoyles and even warriors you don't want to use your warriors too early i would say you know get get through some chaff first before you start to use your actual assets because you don't want to be trading a squad of um warriors for for example mandrakes or something daft like that you want to be using it to get rid of their big stuff and then the key thing is what's the scoreboard saying how hard do you have to push is it go time if you're falling behind on points then you need to start acting if you're not falling behind on points and you're keeping them at arm's length that's a great place to be. If you just rack up your points, just keep it going. You don't need to kill anything. You do not need to be proactive and kill anything if you are winning. Um, I mean, I again that demon matchup. I was um, I was really pleased with it because I barely killed anything except for some chaff. Uh, I didn't really wound much of the big guys. I just move blocked them into non-existence, and it was the nicest thing. I just knew I was winning, so I just keep pushing, keep pushing, keep pushing. Turn four or five really decide how hard you need to push are you the attacker are you on the aggression are you being do you need to be aggressive 
or your opponent needs to be aggressive with you and then react accordingly. Just land the plane is the way I kind of see it. If you're winning, land the plane, deny, deny, deny. Don't let the turbulence come in, just get there. And then end of turn scoring, make a plan or plan to score it or deny it. Get a squad. And the easiest way to do this, keep a squad of gargoyles. Then if your opponent is getting end of turn primary in the last turn, just make it so they cannot physically get there. Even if they charge the gargoyles and then consolidate, just make it so they cannot get to the objective. If you're end of turn scoring, cool. Move <laughs> in between two objectives, fire and fade, score both points. Easy, 40k is easy. Right, cool. So we know our strategy, but what are the tactics we can employ to actually achieve this? Well, every, the ones that I kind of use every game, uh, deny primary fast high OC units. Uh, you'll need assets for all five turns, so do not waste those assets. Make sure you are denying that primary. I've mentioned it a million times already. You know what I'm talking about. Focus your threats on the flanks. Why is this important? The middle is a trap because loan up is so much better if you're going down the sides of the board. If you're in the middle, the amount of units that can get within 12 inches of you exponentially increases. But if you're down the sides of the board, taking those side objectives, so many fewer, so many more units to them are just nullified and just not doing anything. Uh, so do not go into the middle. Let them have the middle. Played Eldai uh, on Saturday. Uh, I did not move into the middle, and his Wraith Knights were kind of sitting there going, "When is anyone going to move into the middle?" His Wraith Guard, sorry. When is anyone going to move into the middle? And I was, I mean, I got to turn four, and he was like, "I need to do something with these Wraith Guard." That's how you nullify those big threats. You don't need to kill them; you just need to nullify them. Um, move blocking is obviously very important. Um, nullifying threats instead of killing them, as I mentioned before. So pre-measure, make sure that they cannot impact you, they cannot affect you. So again, with those Wraith Guard, what's their movement? Uh, can they advance and shoot? No, okay, cool. So what's their range on their gun? Great, so their, their threat range is their movement plus their range. I'll stay outside of that. Thank you very much. Um, the other way to do this is uh, using your gargoyles and just shifting them a couple of inches either way to suggest to your opponent, hey, why don't you go to this flank that I'm not on uh, with your land radar and that's full of aggressors? Why don't you just go and take that objective? So they, they trundle over there to that objective and you go, super, you stay over there. I will just take these other objectives and you will not kill me. And then, of course, the redeploy stratagem, putting units out in the open and then just moving them away. So you can do this. You can put a, you can badly deploy a unit on purpose so your opponent puts stuff out to shoot them. Um, obviously, great players won't really fall for that, but it's an option. You can also suggest that you're going to attack both objectives, then redeploy to attack one objective. And your opponent's like, huh, I've only got half my army going that way and you've got your full army going that way. Huh. Very nice. Other ones, rapid ingress the trigon. It sounds obvious, but man, it's so good. You can use it to obviously take your opponent's objective or reflip an objective they think they've flipped. Sure, right? That makes sense. Uh, which is really good fun. I just think the trigon does so much. Uh, not, it, it, I've never seen it die in one turn before, and that's the best I can say for it. OC4 is amazing because a lot of good stuff is OC3, for example, Sagittarius. Uh, same with, by the way, Exocrines, OC4. Uh, if you are getting up the table, you're starting to run out of assets, just get them on objectives. They are OC4, which is a lot more than some units will be by the time the game, at the end of the game, is up. Um, and then the last thing is I uh, use reactive CP over proactive. Surprise Assault was one of the reasons I got into playing the, the detachment. I now use it once a game max. And that's basically if all my other Battleshock efforts have failed, and I need plus one to hit or something like that, I will use it. If you don't use it and you keep the CP in your turn, you do not use that CP, by the time, and say, for example, you discard a secondary in turn two or one, you'll gain the CP for that, you'll keep the CP again on your turn, and then you'll be standing your opponent's turn on three CP. That's enough for two units to move away on the stratagem that moves away six inches, and then loan up on them which is amazing if your opponent is like, ah, I'm going to kill this warrior squad, moves seven inches away, you then move them six inches away and then say one CP loan up and all of a sudden their master plan to get rid of one of your hammers has failed, you then can reply and absolutely muller that unit. It's expensive, don't be wrong, but having three CP on your turn, it, on their turn is super, super strong. Because also, if you haven't used it, then you can pick up units, put them in back in reserve, things like that. So really nice. 
some things I do um, when I'm trying to be reactive to certain environments. So, for example, if my opponent has lots of indirect shooting, I will take a lot of units off the board so that I only have one that I need to spend the loan option on. It's going to be an expensive game, loan up in that, that unit the entire time, but it's that unit's job to get into that, that area and try and sort it out. Um, if you're against someone who's high progressive, screening is really important. Um, Happy Crumping Wargaming does an amazing video called How to Never Get Beat by World Eaters Again. And it's the, the screening thing there is really, really clever. Um, it's a great video on how to screen. I recommend you go and watch it. And then the Von Ryan's Leapers, if I'm going second, you can strat reserve them. So what I like to do with these, I've done it once and it was awesome. <laughs> And I just, I, it's a finesse thing. I think it's easier said than done. And I think it doesn't come up every game, but it's quite fun. You can say your opponent is going to charge, for example, a Neurolictor that's on an objective. You could say they, they move towards him and you're like, and they're like, great, we're going to, you get the impression they're going to charge. Rapid ingress your Neurolict, your Von Rhein's Leapers within six inches of the Neurolictor. That way, if your opponent charges, they're heroic for free and they have fight first. That is a swing that they did not see coming. And of course, you should be absolutely clear with them what the abilities of these units are. But of course, you're really making them make, a, you're giving them a bad decision to make, which is very nice. And then some TBC reactive changes. I've not played Knights yet and I've not played a Demon Primarch yet. So two big gaps in my own uh, experience that I'm going to try and cover. Right, I am going to drink this wonderful, delicious uh, Australia Dam to wet my whistle. Okay, let's look at some of the issues we have. So we have to talk, walk a bit of a tightrope in certain missions. And these are the ones that I um, really struggle with, especially in my practice games. Obviously, again, like I said before, I lose most of my practice games. That's because I'm trying to get better at the things I'm bad at. So I quite quickly realized Purge of the Fort is a disaster of a mission for us. Hold one, hold more, kill one, kill more. As I mentioned before, we're throwing assets away, trying to keep people off objectives. So if, if I try and hold more during this game, I will give them kill more because they're going to kill whatever's on the objective. If I don't try to kill more, which is difficult for me because I'd have to take more risks, then I will give them hold more. It's very, very difficult, especially if you go second. If you go first, you can try and move, block them in and hope for the best. But you're essentially giving them 12 points every turn and you're getting four, maybe eight. And, you know, it's really, really tough matchup. So what am I trying to do to resolve this? I think the way that I'm trying to do it is, and again, it's, it's easier said than done, is just to do as little as possible for three turns, starve them of kill more, uh, let them have a bit of hold more, that's fine. If they get eight points every turn, that's okay, I suppose. And then have a, if they like encroach into the mid board, start getting cocky, start trying to do stuff, you've let them, you've given them the opportunity to make mistakes. There'll be mistakes in there and then you do full send and go for it. I think that's how you do it. Um, you can also use the Von Ryan's Leapers potentially to get into their backfield objective and again, bother them. Then they start to, put out units more piecemeal and it's a big issue but again it's so so difficult guys so uh don't kick yourself if that one's a hard one to get your head around because i certainly haven't got my head around it yet next mission is take and hold so don't worry it's only the two missions that are in every bloody mission pack that we suck at so don't worry about it guys we're fine uh take and hold hold one hold two hold three uh if you try and hold more you'll you spread out too thin and your opponent can pick up your, you know, they can get within 12 inches of your stuff and will punish you for that. Um, and of course, because, the, the, you know, you can get on as many objectives as they want, move blocking is super tough if you want to try and hold more because you're trying to stop them getting towards all of these objectives, which is, again, really, really difficult. So take and hold is tough. Purge of the four is difficult. Take and hold I've had a little bit more success with, um, and that is really through pushing a flank, trying to wipe out a flank, or just bothering them in their home field, giving them things to think about, uh, trying to distract them from actually scoring points. So, um, Purge of the Four, I was against this the other day. Uh, this is Sam Bodger, wonderful opponent, really great guy. Um, 
I've beaten him twice and he pointed that out before the game started and I said yeah yeah so this will be the third time that I knew in my half heart it was going to be difficult Sam's a very good player and uh, yeah I uh, so in this game this is how it set up he got first turn which is usually really good on Purge of Four because if you kill one unit get an eight point head start but guys what do I kill a unit with here right so the what I decided to do and again really difficult decision here but it was worth eight points i could not do it could not miss it is my exocrine wiggled out around here and shot these these dogs and murdered them in turn one turn a risk because he doesn't necessarily do it if he rolls crap to hit and it was also a risk you know they might just randomly not wound you know i'm really playing to the dice gods but to get eight points at the start of the game how can i say no you might think to yourself, why don't you attack these guys over here, these uh, these assault intercessors with maybe Death Leaper. Well, Death Leaper doesn't automatically kill all of those, absolutely no way. And the Judica gives them fight first. So really interesting interaction here was Death Leaper essentially kept this entire side of the board free from Space Wolves because if they charged him, he had fight first. If I charged them, they had fight first. Of course, you might say, well, that's really good. You've denied that space. In reality, he's the one scoring the points here. So it was a really, with hindsight, I thought this is actually okay. I'm keeping him at arm's length, but in reality, he's still scoring his points. Uh, this paravol is on the bottom floor, by the way. I'm not insane. Um, yeah, and that's really it. Again, I kind of tried to uh, outrange a little bit of stuff here. The dreadnought and this exocrine had a, a, a shooting match with each other for a while. Uh, but nothing more interesting here. But essentially, you can see the problem here. Once these dogs had died, uh, he kept this stuff here. He kept that guys, those guys there. The assassins there. The characters there. The only thing I can kill are dreadnoughts and land raiders. Guess what? I don't like killing dreadnoughts and land raiders. So it was very difficult. By turn three, I was behind by a lot of points, and I had to make a call. And I just went for it. I charged the warriors into a land raider squad. Uh, another squad of von, uh, von Ryan's leapers came in over here and charged into the dreadnought, which had taken a few wounds by then, and then left it on one wound, which would have got me kill more <laughs> and no prisoners actually. Oh no, it was bring it down. It would have got, which was oh, that would have been amazing. The trigon came up over here, which really sucked and got absolutely slapped in the face by Murderfang. Um, my warriors came in over here, came into the into Murderfan, killed him and the squad of assault intercessors, I think they were. But by that time, the jig was firmly up. So you can see the issues we have, especially in the meta. This was Iron Storm Space Wolves. So as an example. Uh, cool. So what else do we struggle with? Well, we struggle with Hammer and Anvil and to a lesser extent, Crucible of Battle, because you can turn it into Dawn of War if you are so lucky. But Hammer and Anvil is an issue. Why is it? Well, let's go back to this matchup. My loan op ability is very, very useful when I've got lots of space to play him. Also, Tyranids, I'm very fast. I can run fast. I can charge, uh, advance and charge. That kind of becomes less relevant when spaces are decreased, right? So if my loan op is here, pretty much half the board can shoot him or her. Uh, whereas if this was uh, uh, Dawn of War, I'd be much safer. So having a narrow space to fight in is really tough for an army that really wants to um, benefit from your opponent's army spreading out, if that makes sense. So a bit of a tough one, a bit of a tough one. So in summary, guys, you've heard me bang on for ages. I'm going to take another sip of a, a wonderful, delicious Australia Dam. Okay. In summary, while we may not hundo our opponents, we can outscore them across primary and secondary. We do that, as I've said, by denying the primary. We don't do this quickly, but over the full five turns, managing our assets well, to, uh, using every asset to deny points while our loan ops score them. We don't engage head to head, but we do it on our own terms, clearing out areas for our loan ops to just sit and be completely safe, get the cup of tea out and just relax. And we disrupt our opponent's plans in our own movement phase using their stratagems. Again, keeping those three CP or two CP every turn so that in your opponent's turn, you've got the freedom of the city to do whatever you like. All right. And that is the end of the video, guys. I just want to wish you amazingly good luck. And thank you very much for sitting through this. Uh, this was a long video. This is, yeah, four, ta four uh, bug watches in one because we haven't done one for a while. I hope you enjoyed it. Please comment in the uh, comments 
what you thought of it, any feedback, anything I've missed, what would you like to see in the future? I'm here for it, guys. And of course, join our Discord. We've got a group of us who are really good, uh, just cracking about Tyranids and giving each other advice. So by all means, please join us. Um, some great lads in there uh, and lasses, potentially. But yes, uh, maybe if you're at Nottingham GT, I'll see you there. Have a good one. Ta-ra.